chief political correspondent for Politic 365 and political science professor at Hiram College, and John Avlon, CNN contributor and senior political columnist for Newsweek and The Daily Beast. Welcome, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, first hey, girl. Up. Good morning. First up, Stephen King, you know, the author, the man best known for his horror novels. Well, he's turning his attention to gun violence. In an op-ed, King, himself a gun owner, writes that he doesn't want to overturn the Second Amendment, but he does say it's time for both sides to stop the rhetoric and think about the bigger picture. King says, quote, you can outlaw AR-15s, but you can't outlaw crazy. The next Adam Lanza is out there somewhere. The job we all have as responsible Americans is to make it as hard for these loonies as possible. Can we at least find a middle ground on that?" End quote. But as King points out, there is no middle ground else in this country. And let's face it, is the gun argument in the country really about the safety of children anymore? So the question this morning, what do you think the gun argument is really about, John? I love Stephen King's essay. Because this is Stephen King as a radical centrist. Uh, and we need more of him out there. Kind of planting that flag, making a strong case that the crazies on either side have disproportionately dominated the debate. And there is a rational middle ground. Reasonable gun restrictions are not about overturning the Second Amendment. So let's stop buying into that myth. We need more voices like this out there, bringing people together and tuning out the crazies rooted in reality. <laughs> Jason. Uh, the, the, the core of the gun argument is just who's asking. If this was any other president who was saying we need gun control, the Republicans would probably be more reasonable with it. All you need is to, it should be as difficult to get a gun as it is to get a driver's license. You should have to prove that you can shoot it, you should have to prove that you're going to be responsible, and you should have to get gun insurance. These are simple solutions, but the argument is about Obama, not about kids, and it's really not even about ideology anymore. All right, on to question number two. As it was one of the signature issues of Obama's first campaign for the White House, the president's pledge to close Gitmo. I have said repeatedly that I intend to close Guantanamo, and I will follow through on that. But once in office, President Obama found it hard to keep that promise as concerns over where to house the detainees grew. Now we're learning that a hunger strike at the detention facility is expanding to 25. One U.S. general is, is playing down those reports, though, saying that action is a result of anger at President Obama. They were particularly put off, I'm told, uh, that when the president has really made no mention of closing the facility. He said nothing in his inauguration speech, and this is them bringing this up to us, that nothing in the inauguration speech about closing it, nothing in the State of the Union. In January, the office working to close Gitmo, set up by the president, it was closed itself. The special envoy in charge reassigned with no plans whatsoever to replace him. Our question, will Gitmo ever close, Jason? You know what, it probably won't, and this is one of the great embarrassments of the 21st century in the United States. These are men and women, these are men who are accused of crimes. It's not Lex Luthor, it's not the Joker, they're not super criminals. They deserve trials, and we should use the American system to find these people guilty, and then put them into a real prison, not holding them forever. And this is an embarrassment that Obama really should take care of. John. Yeah, it, the reality is, of course, that it's not that easy. There's a gap between campaign rhetoric and the responsibilities of office. Um, and, and look, they have, we have created an extra legal situation. Um, but if it was easy to close Guantanamo, it would have been done. And we should try these folks in, in the United States. It is doable. doesn't help that Congress cut off the funding to move them to uh, mainland prisons. But uh, if this was easy, it would have been done. So let's focus on the facts. All right, finally, your buzzer beat. Actually, let's go 30 seconds on this one because it's one of my favorite topics this morning. It turns out Jay okay. Leno, okay, it turns out Jay Leno is a conservative drug anger over Leno may be replaced by Jimmy Fallon. The other 50% of the country and not just liberals. Perhaps Drudge was talking about moments like this. Yes, after losing two presidential elections in a row, the Republican Party now has outlined a plan to attract minorities. I want to attract minorities, women, uh, gay, lesbian, young voters. Show the newest ad. Get ready, America, for a brand new Republican Party. We've changed our position on just about everything. For starters, we'll raise taxes on everyone who makes more money than you. Also, we've decided that we're A-OK -okay with same-sex marriages. In fact, we'll even pay for the honeymoon. And lastly, we'll not only embrace immigrants, we'll make it easier to get into the country by installing a moving sidewalk on the border. The new, more inclusive Republican Party. Sign up today and get a free bag of weed. <laughs> I just love that.
actually, Leno is doing what Rush Limbaugh that. and others have done all week. They are mocking that recent Republican autopsy in a plan to broaden the party. For his part, Leno seems to agree with Drudge about having what you call a big comedy tent. I'm kind of old school. I, I sort of try to reach that broad audience where you try to reach everybody. I mean, The Tonight Show is different from The Daily Show and Colbert and some of these shows because I think they have a specific audience, and excellent. I mean, nobody funnier than the Colbert and, and, and Jon Stewart, but they're reaching a specific audience. I'm reaching, hopefully, some of that audience mm -hmm. and maybe some of their friends and maybe some of their parents and maybe some of their kids, and we're just going for that wide scope. Okay, so our question, are conservatives overlooked in popular culture? Jason. No, and, and this is a ridiculous question. Look, it's, it's not that Jay Leno reaches the other 50%. It's that he's reaching people 50 and older. He talks to an older crowd, an older audience. I, I was a Conan O'Brien kid when I was in college, and so that's why he's probably going to get moved by Jimmy Fallon. And the truth of the matter is, conservatives don't tend to be funny. Look, no one, none of one has liked Dennis Miller since he left Saturday Night Live. If there were conservatives out there that were actually funny, they wouldn't get overlooked by pop culture. That's their problem. <laughs> that is cold. It's true. Oh, John. <laughs> Look, I mean, the, the, large, the question is, are conservatives overlooked in popular culture? The, the reality is that conservatives end up being very often at war with popular culture. They're trying to uh, basically do a flanking move with much of modernity because they want to conserve the past. They are traditionalists. So while there's absolutely a space for kind of a libertarian South Park conservative that makes fun of politically correct excesses, you know, conservatives who feel like they're locked out from popular culture better look in the mirror and get with the program and start working with American culture as it is, not as they wish it was or as it was in the Ooh. past. Tough. Jason Johnson, John Avalon, thanks for playing today. Thank you. Coming up. <laughs> as we just said, Jimmy Fallon might join the ranks of Johnny Carson on the